Hey, how's it going everybody? My name is Trinkill, and if you click this video, then odds are you're wanting to learn how to play Magic the Gathering. If that's the case, I've got some very good news for you because with the launch of Magic Arena, the game has never been easier to get into, easier to learn, or easier to play. With that being said, we're going to be doing most of our learning in the Magic Arena client because I do believe that that is the easiest place to get into and learn how to play Magic the Gathering. Now, before we get started, I can already hear it. I hear the disagreeing. No, Trin Kill. You gotta go down to your local card shop. You gotta get some paper cards in your hand. Play across a table with another human. That's the way the game was meant to be played. And I don't disagree with you. I've been playing since 1996. There's nothing better than the nostalgia of having cards in your hand, playing them on an actual table. However, I don't think that you can disagree with the fact that Magic Arena has eliminated a ton of the problems that new players have with getting into Magic. The first of which being it is totally free. It is free to download, free to play, and they start you with 15 decks worth of cards to begin your collection. That is a massive head start over traditional Magic. Now, are you going to own every card in the game without spending some money? No, it would take you way too long to do that for free, but you will have enough cards to experience every complex mechanic that Magic has to offer offer without spending a dime. That is something that you cannot say about Paper Magic. The second of which being, you may not have any friends that want to play Magic the Gathering with you, or if you're like me, you don't have any friends at all. Arena circumvents that problem by obviously being online, so you no longer have to go into a card shop, hope that there's somebody there who's willing to learn with you, or hope that there's somebody there who's willing to teach you, which leads me to my third problem. You also have to hope that the person teaching you knows how to play the game. They're not iffy on some of the rules. Magic Arena does all of the rules and the mechanics for you. So you can maybe not be the greatest player, but still actually get through a game and play it without having to read through a manual or go online for hours teaching yourself how to play. Now I'm currently in the Magic Arena client. I'm on the Learn More page and you can see that there are even more resources in addition to the simplicities that I've mentioned already. And there's an in-game tutorial. You can always replay should you have forgotten one of the mechanics they teach you. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and learn some of the basics of Magic the Gathering. Now for the bulk of this video, we're going to be watching a sample game. However, there are a few things that I think are important to know before we get started. Now I'm going to assume that a lot of you may be watching this to see if it's a game you're even interested in and therefore have not gone through the in-game tutorial yet. So let's start from the very beginning. Magic the Gathering is a turn-based trading card game, or a strategy game, whatever you want to call it. And in Magic the Gathering, most of the time, especially in Arena, you are going to be playing against a single opponent, and your goal is to beat that opponent by any means necessary. Since this is a beginner's guide, we're going to be focusing on the main way to beat an opponent, and that is reducing their life total from 20 down to 0. Now, there are near countless ways to deal damage to your opponent. You can summon creatures to the battlefield to fight for you in combat. You can cast spells like fireballs and lightning bolts. And there are several other ways that you can deal damage to the other player. However, before we're able to do any of that, we need a way to cast our spells. In Magic the Gathering, similar to several fantasy type games, the resource for casting our spells is called mana. In Magic the Gathering, there are five different colors of mana. white blue, black, red, and green. Now there are several ways to produce mana, but the main way you're going to be doing this is by playing what are called land cards. Now just like there are five colors, there are five different types of basic lands. Each one of them produces one of these five colors. The basic land types are plains, islands, swamps, mountains, and forests, respectively. Now, one more thing before we get into the sample game, most of your spells can only be cast during your turn. However, there are certain spells that can be cast at almost any time, including on your opponent's turn. So if you come from a game like Hearthstone, this concept may feel very foreign to you, and it should because this opens up a ton of complexities that you may not be prepared for. Now, as we get into the sample game, a few turns in, you're going to get to see how some of these, what we call instant speed spells, spells interact with each other. And with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the sample game. Now I'm going to do my best to talk you through turn by turn, play by play, so that you understand exactly what's going on and you get kind of a hands-on experience. If you do happen to get lost in the middle of the video, don't worry about it. There's going to be a lot of information thrown around. Skip back a few seconds and re-watch the part that confused you or we'll recap at the end of the video. Alright, so the first thing you do in a game of Magic is you shuffle your deck, you draw seven cards, and this creates what is called your opening hand. 
Now, as we are learning in Arena, Arena shuffles and draws for us. So the first option that we get is to choose whether or not we like our opening hand enough to keep it. If we don't like that hand, we can choose to take what is called a mulligan. Now, if you're familiar with golf, you probably know what a mulligan is, but it's basically a redo, a do-over, if you will. In Magic the Gathering, the mulligan rules allow you to shuffle your opening hand back into your deck, or as in Magic, we call it your library, and draw a new opening hand, this time with six cards instead of seven. So even though you do get the redo, there are some drawbacks. If you don't like your second opening hand, you can choose to mulligan again, this time drawing five cards instead of six, and so on. Now, even though you don't know a lot about Magic the Gathering, you probably understand that playing with fewer cards than your opponent puts you at a disadvantage. The good news is that the mulligan rules allow you one additional benefit. After a mulligan, once you've finally decided on your opening hand, you look at the top card of your library. You can then choose whether or not you want to keep that card on the top of your library or move it to the bottom. This action is called scrying. So while you do start the game with fewer cards than your opponent, you get to take a peek at the top of your library and choose whether you should or should not manipulate your first draw. In our example, we have a perfectly acceptable opening hand. We have three sources of mana in the three forests that we have, and we have four spells that we're able to cast with that mana. So instead of choosing to mulligan, we're going to keep this opening hand. Now before we do anything, I want you to notice that we have four non-land cards in our hand. Every non-land card has what is called a casting cost. This is the collection of numbers and symbols in the top right corner of your cards. Let's take a look at one of the cards in our opening hand called Druid of the Cowl. This card requires one green mana and one additional mana of any color before we can play it. If you look at the rest of our hand, all of our cards cost at least two or more mana. Now again, like I mentioned before, to get that mana, we have to play our land cards. Now you are restricted to playing a single land card per turn. What this means is that we can play one of our forests, and that forest produces one green mana. Everything in our hand costs at least two to cast, so we can't do anything on our first turn. Therefore, we end our turn, and our opponent takes their first turn. They must be in the same boat because they choose to play their first land and pass the turn right back to us. Now, if you notice, the first thing that happens on this turn is that we draw a card from the top of our library. That will not be the first thing that happens on every given turn, and we'll get into that here in just a second. So we're allowed to play one land per turn. We play our second forest. This gives us enough mana to cast our first spell. So let's go ahead and play that Druid of the Cow we talked about earlier. Now notice when we cast that spell, our lands turn sideways and they now have an arrow symbol on them. This is to indicate that those lands are tapped. The real order of events here was that we tapped our forest to produce green mana and then used that green mana to cast our Druid of the Cowl. However, Arena has a feature called an auto tapper. We choose which spell we would like to play and assuming we have the mana available to cast it, Arena will tap our lands for us. Cards that have been tapped have had their resources expended for this turn and cannot be used again until the following turn. Now let's go ahead and look at our Druid of the Cow. This type of card is called a creature card. Every creature card in Magic the Gathering has two numbers in the bottom right hand corner. These two numbers are called the power and the toughness of that creature. The power indicates how much damage that creature will do in combat, and the toughness will indicate how much damage that creature can take in a given turn before it dies. Now, damage inside a single turn is cumulative, so if our Druid of the Cal takes one damage from one source, one damage from another source, and a third damage from a third source, then it will die. If it only takes two damage from any number of sources, and our turn ends before our opponent can deal the third damage to kill our Druid of the Cow, at the end of our turn, that Druid of the Cow will heal back to full toughness as if it was never damaged. One last thing to notice about casting creatures, the first turn a creature comes into play, it has what is called Summoning Sickness. This means a creature cannot attack, nor can it use any abilities that require it to tap in the first turn it comes into play. Because we can produce no more mana and our creature is summoning sick, we have no more actions we can take on this turn, and again, we pass the turn to our opponent. Our opponent draws a card, plays their second planes, and apparently either has nothing that they can cast or nothing that they would like to cast right now, so they pass the turn back to us. Now, unlike last turn where we drew a card first, on this turn, notice what happens to our forests. Our forests untap so that we can use them again. This is technically the first thing that happened last turn, but as our forests were not tapped last turn, we didn't get to visually see that happen. 
After our forests untap, then we draw our card, and our play continues like normal. This is our third turn, so we can play our third forest, and we choose to cast a spell called Centaur Courser. This is a fairly simple creature, it has no abilities, but it does have three power and three toughness. So now on our third turn, we enter into uncharted territory. We actually get to have what is called a combat phase. Since our Druid of the Cowl is no longer summoning sick, it gives us the option to attack. In Magic the Gathering, 9 times out of 10, you are only going to be able to attack your opponent. There are times where you're going to have another target to attack called a Planeswalker, but that's a little beyond a beginner's guide, so we'll talk about that in subsequent episodes. Now, unlike games like Hearthstone, you cannot choose to attack specific creatures. You attack the opponent, and the opponent chooses which creatures they would like to defend with. This is called blocking. Now, we'll get to that in a few turns, but our opponent currently has no creatures to block with, therefore, they take the one damage from the power of our Druid of the Cowl. Now, notice that just like our lands, our Druid of the Cowl ends up tapped. As there's only one combat phase per turn, this is to indicate that we can no longer attack, nor can we use abilities that require the Druid of the Cowl to tap. Again, now our Druid of the Cowl is tapped, our three lands are tapped, and our Centaur Courser has Summoning Sickness, therefore we can take no more actions, and again, pass the turn. Our opponent draws a card, plays their third planes, casts a creature spell called Loxodon Linebreaker, and passes the turn back to us. On our fourth turn, we play our fourth forest, giving us a total of four mana, meaning we finally have enough mana to cast multiple spells in a single turn. So we're going to play our Greenwood Sentinel, and we're going to follow that up by casting a spell called Blanchwood Armor. First, notice that Greenwood Sentinel costs two mana. Blanchwood Armor costs three mana, which is a total of five mana. But we only have four forests, so how do we have enough mana to cast both of those spells? If we take another look at our Druid of the Cow, you can see that the Druid of the Cow has an ability that allows you to tap it for one green mana. This is a good illustration on how lands are not your only sources of mana. Now let's take a look at Blanchwood Armor. What did that do? Blanchwood Armor is a new type of spell that we have not seen called an enchantment, more specifically an aura. Aura spells target something and modify it in some way. That something is usually a creature. In this instance, our Blanchwood Armor makes one of our creatures bigger. It increases their power and toughness by one for each forest that we control. As we do control four forests, when we cast Blanchwood Armor onto our Centaur Courser, it takes it from three power and three toughness, or as we say in Magic, a 3-3, three, three, and makes it a 7-7. Seven, seven. So we attack with our Centaur Courser. This time, our opponent has the opportunity to block with their Loxodon and Linebreaker. However, they choose not to block, and they end up taking the full 7 damage. Now we've tapped our Druid of the Cow for mana. All four of our forests are tapped. We've already attacked with our Centaur Courser, and our Greenwood Sentinel has Summoning Sickness. Therefore, we can take no additional actions, and we pass our turn. Okay, so four turns through, we're going to go ahead and ease up on the hand-holding a little bit, so that means we're not going to talk about playing lands, drawing cards, passing turns. We're going to talk about new cards as they come out and new mechanics as they come up. Speaking of new cards, our opponent casts a card called Luminous Bonds, and this is another aura-type enchantment. Instead of buffing our creature, this one hinders our creature so that it can't attack or block. And speaking of new mechanics, on our turn, we cast our first Sorcery spell. Up until this point, every single card that you have seen played has been a permanent spell. A permanent spell is a type of spell that when played, enters the battlefield and stays on the battlefield until it is removed in some way. There are two types of non-permanent spells, instants and sorceries. When you cast an instant or sorcery spell, like our Rabid Bite here, instead of entering the battlefield, the Rabid Bite goes straight to our discard pile, which in Magic the Gathering is called the Graveyard. When you play Rabid Bite, you choose one of your creatures, and you choose one of your opponent's creatures, and your creature deals damage equal to its power to the opponent's creature. Now also notice, when a creature that is on the battlefield, or any permanent that is on the battlefield, is destroyed in some way, it also goes to the graveyard. We attack with our two creatures for a total of three damage. On the opponent's turn, they play a card called Star Crown Stag, and on our turn, we choose to attack with our creatures again. And on this play, you finally get to see two things, a blocking creature and an instant speed spell. First off, let's discuss blocking. The first thing we do is declare our attackers. We show our opponent which creatures we are choosing to attack with, and we lock that in. Once we do that, the opponent has time to choose which creatures they would like to block with their creatures. They declare which creatures are blocking which attackers, and they lock that in. 
At this time, both creatures deal their power in damage to the opposing creature's toughness. Again, just like all damage, if this damage is equal to or greater than the toughness of the creature, that creature will die. In this instance, the Starcrown Stag has three power. Our Druid of the Cow only has one power. Therefore, our Druid of the Cow will only deal one damage to the Starcrown Stag, but that Starcrown Stag will deal three damage to our Druid of the Cow, which would effectively kill it. And this is where you learn about instant speed spells. Now you remember before the sample game, I spoke about the fact that there were spells that you could cast at almost any time. Instants are one of those types of spells. It's situations like this where magic starts to separate itself from other card games. So now that the opponent has declared his Star Crown Stag as blocking my Druid of the Cowl, I can respond to that decision with an instant spell. Therefore, I choose to cast my Titanic Growth on my Druid of the Cowl. Titanic Growth is going to buff our creature by 4 power and 4 toughness, taking it from a 1-3 to a 5-7. This gives us enough power to kill the Star Crown Stag, all the while giving us enough toughness to be saved from death. While all this is happening, our Greenwood Sentinel slips by unblocked for 2 damage. Now notice that both times we've attacked with our Druid of the Cal, it's ended up tapped after the attack. However, our Greenwood Sentinel remains untapped. This is due to a common ability, otherwise known as a keyword ability, called Vigilance. We'll get into keyword abilities in another video. However, Vigilance means that a creature does not tap to attack. One thing that I did not mention about blocking yet is the fact that if a creature chooses to attack and is left tapped after an attack, it will no longer be eligible to block. The benefit of a creature with Vigilance is that it can be declared as an attacker, it does not tap to attack, therefore on the opponent's turn, it is also eligible to be used as a blocker. We go ahead and play our second Druid of the Cow. On our opponent's turn, they play a card called Daybreak Chaplain, and they buff that creature with an aura called Knight's Pledge. Knight's Pledge just gives that creature plus two, plus two, making it a three, five. On our turn, we draw another Titanic Growth, and we choose to attack with everything. The reason we're attacking with all three of our creatures is that they only have one creature to block with. We have a titanic growth, meaning that we can make any one of our creatures that they choose to block big enough to kill that creature and survive. However, our opponent responds with their own instant spell called Tactical Advantage. This is the first time you're able to see how interactions with instants work. Once you start playing instant spells in response to one another, they go on what is called the stack. In Paper Magic, it is a physical stack of cards. In Arena, you can see that the Tactical Advantage looks like it is on top of the Titanic Growth. In Magic the Gathering, there's a rule called Last In, First Out. This means that the most recently cast spell will be the first to resolve. So if you'll notice, Tactical Advantage will resolve first, making their Daybreak Chaplain a 5-7, and then our Titanic Growth will resolve, making our Druid of the Cow a 5-7. So unfortunately, both of those creatures are going to survive, but we do get 2 damage from our Greenwood Sentinel and 1 damage from our Druid of the Cow through, taking them from 7 health down to 4, but wait a minute, they shoot back up to 9 health, what happened there? This is due to a keyword on their Daybreak Chaplain called Lifelink. When a creature with Lifelink deals damage, its controller gains that much health. Now because our Druid of the Cal hit their Chaplain for 5 damage during the attack, and their Chaplain dealt 5 damage to our Druid of the Cal during blocking, the 5 damage that the Chaplain dealt to the Druid of the Cal is given to our opponent in life. So not only did our opponent counterplay our Titanic Growth and allow their creature to live, they also healed in the process putting us further away from victory. That was a pretty good play on their part. On their turn, they play a card called Inspiring Commander, they choose not to attack, and on our turn, we play two cards, one called Elvish Rejuvenator, and another called Highland Game. Our Rejuvenator allows us to look at the top of our library, and if we find a land card there, put it into play tapped. We also choose not to attack this turn because both of their creatures are bigger than all of our creatures, therefore we would just be sending our creatures to their own death. Our opponent draws a card, but chooses not to do anything on their turn. So on our turn, we draw another Blanchwood Armor. We choose to play that Blanchwood Armor on our Greenwood Sentinel, and we do so because, remember, with Vigilance, it does not tap to attack. This makes our Greenwood Sentinel big enough to safely attack the opponent. So we choose to attack only with our Greenwood Sentinel. Our opponent responds with an instant speed spell called Confront the Assault. 
which does two things. First off, if you are being attacked, you can cast Confront the Assault to create three 1-1 one, one white spirit creature tokens with flying. Now that sentence has a ton of descriptors in it. However, in its most simplest form, this card creates three 1-1 one, one flying creatures, and that's pretty much it. We'll get into the keyword flying as soon as we have an example. Now, in addition to the three creatures, the ability of our opponent's inspiring commander reads, whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life and draw one card. Because those three spirit tokens enter the battlefield with less than two power, the inspiring commander will heal our opponent for three life and draw them three cards. This is another good play by our opponent. However, after two pretty good plays, they make a misstep during this blocking phase. A very important thing to know about attacking and blocking. When a creature becomes blocked, unless it has a keyword ability called trample, any amount of toughness blocking any amount of power is enough to stop all of the damage to the opponent. Another thing that you can do during blocking is you can declare multiple blockers for a single creature. In this instance, our opponent has chosen to block with a Daybreak Chaplain and two 1-1 Spirit Tokens. When they do this, all three of their creatures are going to deal damage to our Greenwood Sentinel, meaning you add three power from the Chaplain, one power from one token, and one power from another token for a total of five damage that's going to be done to the Greenwood Sentinel. Now, the benefit of doing this is that you may be completely okay with losing these three creatures to kill the opponent's bigger and potentially better creature. The benefit the attacker gets is that they get to choose in which order their creature is going to deal damage to the opponent's blockers. So in this instance, our Greenwood Sentinel has seven power. We're gonna deal five of our damage to the Chaplain. We've got two damage left over from our seven power, one of which is going to go to the first spirit token, the other of which is going to go to the second spirit token. So in this example, all three of our opponent's creatures are going to die, and because it's only taking five damage, our Greenwood Sentinel is going to live. The opponent could have blocked our seven damage with one spirit token and accomplished the same thing while having the other spirit token and the chaplain left alive. This is obviously just because the opponent is new and wasn't 100% sure on how blocking mechanics worked. On our opponent's turn, they play a card called Sarah Angel. This is a 4-4 flying vigilance creature. Sarah Angel being flying is pretty unfortunate for us. Like you're going to see in a second, flying would mean that creatures with flying can only be blocked by other creatures with flying or by creatures with another ability called reach. As we have no flying creatures and no creatures with the ability reach, the Sarah Angel and that 1-1 spirit token are going to be completely unblockable for now. In addition to that, she does not tap to attack because she is vigilant. Therefore, our opponent can freely attack with the Sarah Angel and have her available to block the following turn. And on top of that, our opponent casts Knight's Pledge on her, making her a 6-6. So just like that, our opponent swings the game back in their favor. Because they have 7 damage on the board that we can do nothing about, and we only have 19 health, we have 3 turns to live before our opponent wins. We're really going to need to be lucky with our draws if we're going to win this game. So we cross our fingers and hope for a good luck draw. Oh, it's another Greenwood Sentinel. Well, that is not going to do it. We attack with our Greenwood Sentinel just to see how our opponent reacts. If they're smart, they will not block with their Sarah Angel, and should probably block with their Inspiring Commander. However, they choose to take all 7 damage, and then we play our second Greenwood Sentinel past the turn. Our opponent plays another basic creature. This is just a creature with 3 power and 1 toughness, and attacks again with Sarah Angel and their 1-1 one, one spirit token that we can do nothing about, so we take 7 damage. And we draw the mother of all draws, Galta Primal Hunger. So before we play our Galta, we're going to go ahead and attack with that same Greenwood Sentinel again, just to see how our opponent reacts. Remember, they could kill this Greenwood Sentinel at any time should they choose to block with their Sarah Angel and any additional creature. However, there's no way they're going to do that because currently Sarah Angel is going to win them the game. So they block with their Oresco Swift Claw, probably what they should have done with their Inspiring Commander last turn. And we play our Galta Primal Hunger. Now Galta cost 12 mana, 10 colorless, and 2 green. However, the colorless cost is reduced by one for each power that we already have on the board. Considering we have 22 power in play, then all 10 of his colorless mana is going to come off of his casting cost, and we get to play a 12-12 Trample for two mana. Now, we mentioned Trample earlier, and this is the keyword that's going to put our opponent in the hot seat. 
A creature that has trample deals combat damage the same way to a blocker as all of the other creatures. However, a creature with trample, when blocked, deals its excess damage to the opponent. We'll get to see that in action on our next turn. On our opponent's turn, they attack with their Sarah Angel, putting us at 6 health. Now notice, if they get another turn, they have 7 unblockable damage we can do nothing about, and they will win. Meaning, we have to win on our next turn. Because of that, we have nothing to lose, and we attack with everything. Now, no matter how they block, we have lethal damage coming from this attack. So we have to hope that our opponent has no combat tricks in their hand. They block our Greenwood Sentinel with their 1-1 Spirit Token. That's a good block. They choose to block our Highland game with their Inspiring Commander, and they block our Galta with their Sarah Angel. Enter Trample Damage. A prompt pops up, shows you that you're going to deal 6 damage to the Sarah Angel, therefore you will have 6 damage remaining that will trample over to the opponent. Our opponent had no combat tricks, they had no instants in their hand that were going to save them the game, therefore the lethal combat damage that we had on board wins us the game. And there you have it, you've watched your first game of Magic. So what all did we learn today? Let's do a brief recap. So the first thing we learned is that you can't play any spells without mana, probably a mana of a specific color. We learned that you have to play land cards to get that mana. You can only play one land card per turn, and to get the mana out of the land, you have to tap it. That mana is then used as the currency to pay the casting cost of the spells you'd like to play. Remember that most cards are going to require a specific color or multiple specific colors, but some of them also require that you pay an additional cost of any color. We learned about three of the five permanent types, lands, creatures, and enchantments. We also learned about the two non-permanent spell types, sorceries and instants. We learned what separates instants from the rest of the cards. Remember, instants can be played at almost any time and can be played in response to things. We learned about our creatures, power and toughness. We learned about a few of their keywords, vigilance, flying, trample. We learned about combat and how power equals damage and toughness equals the creature's life. We also learned how some of the keywords on the creatures interact with each other. And most importantly, we learned how to draw our cards exactly when we need them. This is called top decking and is an invaluable skill to master. So there you have it everybody, your first taste of Magic the Gathering. Hopefully you learned enough and it's intrigued you enough to go try it out for yourself. Now obviously we didn't cover everything about Magic the Gathering in this video, so there will be subsequent videos released where we'll show a lot more detail and dig into some more specifics. Until then, if you guys have any questions, you can try to leave them in the comment section below. I can't promise that I will answer them here, but if you head on over to my stream, twitch.tv slash trendstreamv01, I will answer your questions live. We stream every Tuesday through Friday at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, and Tuesdays specifically are beginner's days. So head on over to the stream, join the fun over there, ask as many questions as you need to ask to get caught up, and if you don't happen to head on over to the stream, no worry, I appreciate you for watching this video, and I will see you in the next one. Yeah.